We have Professor uh, Sunil Mukhi with us, uh, who is the speaker of today's lecture. He's a theoretical physicist and working in the areas of string theory, quantum field theory, and particle physics. Currently, he's adjunct professor at the International Center of Theoretical Sciences at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research and honorary professor of emeritus at the Indian Institute of Science, Education, and Research, Pune. So welcome, Professor Mukhi and uh, Professor Kamar. We shall now begin the session. So over to you, sir. Thank you so much. So I start, I like to start with a quote by these two gentlemen, uh, very familiar to us. Uh, Tagore said, truth comes as conqueror only to those who have lost the art of receiving it as friend. And it's unfortunate in a way to quote this uh, in a talk on ethics, but it, uh, it suggests that um, if you don't pay attention to ethics on your own, it will force itself on you uh, somewhere in your life. And of course, Einstein uh, said, um, at least I believe he said, that relativity applies to physics, not ethics. So these with these two quotes uh, in mind, I'll start the discussion. And then I also have two disclaimers. Uh, I'll basically talk on practical issues because I'm really not a social scientist and I'm not an expert on ethical theory which is a very important subject. So I have somewhat amateur comments and I'll make those, but uh, that's where it is. <clears throat> the second thing is I have tried not to give a talk that's only of interest to physics people or science people, but because of my interests, you may see some examples in these fields. And I hope that it doesn't give too much emphasis to my own field. And I hope the things I'll show you will be a little bit more general. Okay, so let's start with um, some generalities. So uh, from whatever I could learn, the very simple summary of ethics is that it's the study of right action. And we know that ethics is the root behind law, but there are crucial differences in what we mean by ethics and what we mean by law. So law is defined country to country. If you cross a border, suddenly a law will change. Uh, if you fail to obey the law, it, you may find yourself on the wrong side of authority. So there's a certain level of force could be involved in making people obey the law uh, through the justice system and the police. But on the other hand, ethical principles really are meaningful uh, as a kind of organic thing, as a plant which grows in our communities. And I'll try to address it in that spirit uh, from the perspective of the academic community in India. So ethical principles are implemented within a profession, within a community, and they are not uh, one size fits all type of principles. They encompass a very rich and desirably rich diversity of approaches. So diversity is very important when we talk of ethics. Uh, you, you may be surprised to know that uh, certain ethical principles in, in, in solid state physics and particle physics are different. So they are different practices. So not to talk of then chemistry, biology, and then humanities, literature, psychology, medicine. So, you know, they vary a lot and we should be aware that they can vary, even though the, you know, the core principles may still be universal. Now, uh, one thing is that when we think of our own ethical principles, most people have a tendency to believe that they come came to us by their obviousness, that uh, it's clear what is right, what's wrong, you shouldn't cheat or what you should do, what you can do. But in fact, ethical principles are largely absorbed and developed by the environment we find ourselves in, uh, where we grow up, where we are taught, where we work eventually. And, and the influences on ethics are both from philosophical thought and religious thought, which also are interlinked. And it can happen that our ethical ideas are not necessarily related to our religion at birth, uh, and they also may apply to people who don't have any religion. So just as one example, which came to me when thinking about such uh, uh, issues, uh, I went to a Christian school. A lot of people have done that. I'm not a Christian myself. Uh, and it was a very good school. And they were careful not to teach us specific things to Christianity. But I feel sure that just being in that school and college, actually, 
my view of what right and wrong means, what good and bad means, probably had some background influence from Christian theology. It could be. And there's nothing good or bad about it. I'm just saying that one should acknowledge it because these are our influences and uh, we should be a little conscious where they come from. So it helps to be aware of our sources, of the sources of our uh, opinions and our uh, principles, uh, even though there is no single philosophy which will get, which is guaranteed to make us more ethical or less ethical. Now, if you look up um, on the internet or look in books, you find a number of types of ethical philosophies, and I'll just quickly list them for you because it's definitely not the main... Uh, purpose of my talk to go through these, but I'll just list them because these are sometimes conflicting, sometimes they are, uh, they can coexist. So ethical relativism, this is what Einstein said that it uh, does not exist, but actually it does. Uh, the idea that moral principles are strictly subservient to cultural standards. Uh, deontology is a school of thought which emphasizes duty and moral rules and virtuous acts. Pragmatic ethics argues that as a result of inquiry, scientific inquiry, one can make norms, principles, and criteria more objective. Uh, consequentialism is a kind of uh, approach to ethics where every action is judged largely by its consequences. As I said, these are not all conflicting. These are just things that one, one reads about, and each of them has its own history. Virtue ethics uh, uh, talks of internalizing moral behavior and emphasizes the importance of achieving excellence. And finally, perhaps my favorite one, so I'm sorry for uh, trying to make this funny, but all moral standards depend on God that is called divine command theory. And in academics, sometimes it might mean our vice chancellor or in politics, it might mean our nation's leader. And uh, this is a somewhat... Um, these, uh, this divine command theory is somehow, uh, I feel a little bit in, in opposition to all these other kinds because it places uh, the, the judgment of what is ethics on one single source, which could be a person or it could be the figure of God. Now, a very nice quote from a very simple source, which I value, is, which is Wikipedia. I like the way they put this. Uh, they wrote that in ethics, the issues are most often multifaceted and the best proposed actions address many different areas concurrently. In ethical decisions, the answer is almost never a yes or no or a right or wrong statement. And again, uh, uh, for people who are listening and people who are interested, you know, we are conditioned to believe that something has to be right and something has to be wrong. But ethics often grap grapples with the complexity of right and wrong, much beyond a simple uh, one-line statement. And um, one of my pleas or requests is that in our country, we should learn to grapple with ethics with intellectual rigor and with effort and not be uh, lazy and try to jump to a yes or no conclusion on everything. So it's a complex and subtle topic it requires a nuanced approach. And I feel that this is missing in academia where we all understand that our own subject is complex. If you ask uh, me, particle physics is a complex and sub subtle topic. But then uh, uh, I cannot then say that, no, but ethics is something simple. I'm sure I already know it. I'm born knowing. So that's not a correct attitude. So I put forward two key practical considerations, which I think we academics can use to guide our ethical thinking, and it might apply even more broadly. So uh, one is reciprocity, and this is the principle that we should do towards others as we would like them to do towards us, okay? Uh, and uh, a nice example, why do we agree that plagiarism is bad and we should not do it? Because we as authors ourselves don't want our work plagiarized by others. So in the abstract sense, we see that if I don't want you to do that thing, then, then uh, I should also not do the same thing. You also have the right to demand that of me. So this is reciprocity. And it's a surprisingly simple principle 
that helps us a lot just in thinking about ethics and i rarely see it highlighted uh, in our in in our country and in our academic community but i think it could do with a little more amplification there's a second one which is outcome directedness for lack of a better word which asks the question uh, does the behavior ethical behavior meet valid goals so this is a little bit of descendant of what i called earlier consequentialism what is the consequence of ethics but i mean it in a very very practical sense for example if i know somebody who cheats in the engineering school i disapprove of that but why do i disapprove because if they go on to become a space scientist and they go on to build a space probe then their ignorance could cause it to crash and we could argue backwards that yesterday we had a very spectacular landing of chandrayaan 3 and it's reasonable to expect that the people who worked on that followed ethical principles in learning their subjects such as not cheating in their exams uh, on the average on the whole because after all their engineering worked of course if it didn't work that doesn't prove that they were unethical this works only one way we say that look if you cheat then you are increasing the risk of a negative outcome okay but of course if you don't cheat there's always a risk of a negative outcome but that's you know goes under the headline of doing your best so this is a kind of why question why do we disapprove of cheating in the first place and i bring this up because students uh, especially where i teach at least don't seem to always understand why we tell them not to cheat in exams they actually don't seem to grasp it and i feel that it's our job to explain so i try to explain such things through reciprocity and outcome directedness maybe it's very oversimplified maybe an ethicist will say there are million other things but i feel that in academia if we focus on these we learn something valuable and if we believe these two then it becomes obvious that every academic person should feel compelled to weed out any malpractice from the system but i claim this is not happening sufficiently and this is the crisis in the title of my talk and also of an article i wrote in the hindu couple of weeks ago so now i won't be actually going through the article as such i've tried to orient this talk in a more constructive way to give you some thoughts about what we can do but let's try to analyze some of the failures so when does reciprocity fail that i behave towards you the way i expect you to behave towards me this may fail if i see the system as inherently unjust if i for example am surrounded by senior people who get away with plagiarism and benefit from it then i may be inclined to argue why not me or everyone is doing it this will come up again in my talk similarly outcome directedness can fail when one's thinking is short term so a student who cheats in exams may fail to realize that rampant cheating in exams which is the case in india today downgrades the credibility of every indian academic in the entire world so that student is harming the rest of indian academia in along with themselves they are basically helping to sink a ship which we all it is in our interest to see that it doesn't sink so this is a a kind of um, rough diagnosis of cases where these nice principles of reciprocity and outcome directedness can fail uh, can fail to be applied by us here is a picture i show um i sir students every time i get a chance to talk about ethics and basically you i'm sure you have seen it it's a very iconic picture of cheating uh, in a school exam where the families and relatives climbed up the walls of the building to pass chits into the exam hall and help students from their families or their friends to cheat and my point is well let's say that you don't care anything about ethics this was aired on bbc and this is making opinions around the world do you care about that so this is somehow the uh, the consequential ist approach that is even if you know even if moral principles don't come to you they should of course but if they don't at least you ought to realize the damage that you are doing by 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 cheating uh, to the whole community and to the image of the community and therefore also its practical prospects okay 
So now let me get into some a uh, little bit more detailed uh, issues regarding academic ethics. And uh, I'll highlight the three types of problems that we typically face. One is a problem of unacceptable practices. So in science, certainly data manipulation and plagiarism are big problems. I think they're both problems in other fields also. And very broadly, these are the individual responsibility of each academic. We also tell our students in ISER that even if your advisor tells you to cheat, you're not supposed to cheat. So don't tell us later that I cheated because my advisor said. A second class of problems is insufficiently enabling environment, which is an environment typically involving discrimination of a, or an inappropriate level of hierarchy. And here it's more the responsibility of people in power or authority, not so much the individual members of the system, though it can also be them. So some examples would be favoring or disfavoring some gender, caste, or religion. That's a non-enabling environment. Demanding authorship for some uh, senior person by virtue of their power rather than what they've actually done. It's called guest authorship. Holding meetings which are like selections or promotions where outcomes are pre-decided and the meeting is rigged. Unfortunately, all of us know about these things. Trading favors for loyalty. So if you are loyal to me, I will give you a promotion. So in a committee meeting, you should not oppose me, that sort of thing. So these are poor enabling environments. The third problem is mishandling of cases that actually come up. And this is absolutely the responsibility of people in authority starting at the very top. That is the vice chancellor, the director, the president, the head of department, the dean, whoever it is. It's, it starts there because these are people who have authority. Now, one classic example is that a major infraction is found, but it leads to no penalty or it leads to a very minor penalty. Curiously, I have seen the reverse. A very minor infraction is found and it leads to a huge penalty for no good reason. I'll be arguing against that too. The third one, which is very interesting and it's always topical, unfortunately, Authority intervenes at random intervals, but doesn't systematically discourage practices which they perfectly well know about. So when we read very sad cases like what is in the news right now about a death due to ragging, allegedly, it's pretty clear that things were going on in open air of the hostel where any, any authority could have just seen what was happening. And it's unthinkable that with security, with other students being present, that nobody would report this as a routine thing. But authorities basically stay quiet until some crisis hits the news cycle and then suddenly intervene. And then, you know, surely now whoever is caught will, well, not surely, but maybe they'll be punished. And then things go back to normal. So these are all mishandling of cases. So to address these problems, I claim we need three things. One is actual guidelines in writing, ethical guidelines. Second is training in these guidelines. Just handing out guidelines doesn't do anything. People don't read them. Let me just say, I have repeatedly interacted with people, including top academicians who didn't bother to read a five page document of their own institute, okay? Uh, so that uh, training in the guidelines and finally implementation of the guidelines. The guidelines should also tell you what to do to implement them. Now, you will find that many institutes in India have something called a code of conduct, a set of orders. And the orders are both dictatorial in nature as well as very, um, I would say bland and uh, not specific. Okay, and I'll give examples. But this misses the key point. I said that ethics or ethical codes work as an organic thing in society, in a community. And so people will follow ethics if they can be told and explained what is the reason for those codes, not if they are ordered to follow the codes without any explanation. Okay, now my institute, ISER Pune, um, has a peculiar document which says something like this, every student shall at all times maintain proper behavior. And this kind of thing makes me always 
cringe because you know we are supposed to be creative surely improper behavior is the least stuff but that we would expect from a creative person just read the lives of creative people they you know stayed awake at night they slept in the day they they had slightly edgy behavior of course there must be boundaries but proper behavior is not my idea of what a creative person or a person we are training is supposed to exhibit there should be surely some detail that goes beyond a silly word like proper and a student reading this just reads it as blah 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 the student gets nothing from this and it offers no guidance to the student however the same institute where i am also has an ethics document and i am very proud because i helped to formulate it about 10 years ago and i think this uh, ticks the right box and i'll i've shown you a little uh, uh, beginning part of it the um, indian institute of science education and research pune expects all its members to follow the highest standards of academic ethics this document describes how these standards are to be implemented in two sentences it is said that we are not only expecting something we are also going to tell you what we expect and i can assure you that, that proper behavior is not part of it there are details of what you should and should not do and also why in the context of teaching conducting research publishing publishing papers training and carrying out administration and various situations are highlighted where misconduct could occur and the remedial or disciplinary procedures are described and this is where you can all view this document if you wish <clears throat> now the first type of guide so we have both uh, but the first type of guidelines which i'll call proper behavior uh is quite common you find codes of conduct all over the place and there are words like solemn duty and patriotism and so on which are all nice words and i am not denying that solemn duty and patriotism are good things but they are read as blah 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 they are not read as any serious kind of guideline so let's look for institutes which have the second type now uh, i regularly search the internet for some name of an institute and ethics guidelines and i see what comes up and uh, some nice guidelines that came up one is from tifr where i used to work one is from iisc bangalore one is from the indian academy of sciences one is ict uh, then there's iser pune and there's now very recently both csir and ugc have something that i would qualify as uh, reasonably good i could criticize them and i will but i think they are pretty good and note that they are only 3 years old while tifrs is in dates from 2002 so there is a 20 year lost period when some of these important institutes were not doing what they should have done and well things are better now than they used to be and that's something that is caused to be happy but they could still get better than this now one little digression i'll mention that medical ethics guidelines are found in all medical related institutes and that's fine it's good but it's very limited in scope because they typically they set out conditions for a research proposal like you're going to do research on humans prove to us that you are not going to unethically harm those humans or animals or whatever good important but it's not the whole subject of ethics medical ethics is a very specific thing and it's already an integral part of medical research so it has to be there these are ethics uh, documents that the institute has no choice about some institutes have strange things that are called ethics document but they don't even touch on plagiarism for example this one from iit bombay starts with institute ethics committee but if you go to the middle of the page the role is as prescribed by indian council of medical research and it mandate is to review biomedical and health related research proposals so just what i said hmm? but it's sold as a kind of document of ethics but the ethics document is missing maybe iit bombay has one i couldn't find it on the web i found only this now ugc and insa both have brought out 200 page books of opinions which are like 10 10 page articles by many people uh, people who are basically academics of some kind or other not experts uh, full disclosure i also wrote one of the articles in the right side this insa book with the colorful uh, title but frankly there are no binding ethics guidelines here it the insa does not say that every fellow of insa has to follow this book or anything 
uh, UGC tries to say something but doesn't say it very clearly. Uh, and they also have this document, which is better. It's uh, good academic research practices. It's very recent. I think this is quite well intentioned. It's about 50 pages long, but it calls for every organization under UGC to have an office of rich integrity. And I can't find any sign of such a thing in most Indian institutions. You just don't find this office existing. Or it simply says, well, the principal is the, or the, the headmaster or the director or the vice chancellor is the head of some office of research integrity, which in practice doesn't do anything. Unless that office invites and welcomes uh, comments, complaints, suggestions, how to improve ethical standards, there's no point having such an office. This name is copied from the American system where actually office of research integrity is widespread. Okay, then you see things like this. So a former minister suggested in parliament that an office of research integrity, now I think he means national one, may be set up which will report directly to the prime minister. Okay, basically he's already saying it won't do anything. The prime minister has a lot of things to do running a country without looking into every little research integrity issue. That's not what we are looking for. And the minister or former minister also brilliantly said, we must dismiss all faculty members guilty of plagiarizing, but this is a poorly informed statement and I'll go into some detail to tell you why it's poorly informed. And this brings me to my next topic, which is implementation of ethical guidelines. So as with everything else, one needs expertise and a sense of balance and proportion. And one of my uh, regrets in being involved in this field in India over many years, more than 20, is that balance and proportion often I find missing. And I'll try to highlight where it can be restored. So in my view, at least, when an ethics complaint is received by authorities, or when authorities come to know about possible misconduct, even without a complaint reaching them, they should carry out the following steps. Step one, collect the facts. Step two, collect the facts. Step three, collect the facts. I'm repeating this because this is the one thing that gets missed. They usually jump straight to a conclusion bypassing steps one, two, and three, which are all involving a lot of hard work. And I've had the privilege and a dubious privilege to work on some of these investigations. And I found that if you take the effort, you can get the facts. And once you have the facts, then you need to talk to the accused person and hear their version of the story with an open mind because everyone is in innocent until proven guilty and then come to a balanced rational conclusion and if needed, recommend appropriate punishment, which let me emphasize for a few lines that are plagiarized is not the death penalty or dismissal. It might be something much less. We don't want to implement guidelines of ethics for the sake of, for the joy of punishment, but for the improvement of ethics. That's something to be kept in mind. So here on the contrary are some steps to avoid. To ignore a complaint because the subject of the complaint is a powerful person. I think this is in, in India number one reason to ignore complaints. Ignore, this is also a weird reason, second one. Ignore a complaint because you believe your organization will look bad if misconduct is found. Of course, it will look worse if misconduct is there and not found and not punished. But people don't see it that way. Some people tell me they will ignore a complaint because the subject of the complaint may take them to court. This is completely bizarre. First of all, you have done nothing before you even act, you're assuming the subject will take you to court. Why? I mean, you have to collect the facts. If you're taken to court, take the facts to court. Actually, I have looked a little bit at judgments, legal judgments relating to ethics and courts very, very rarely interfere when an institute following proper procedures and careful collection of facts has taken a decision. They are quite respectful of that. Uh, so this fear is usually unfounded. On the contrary, punish forcefully if the subject is very low in the hierarchy. If you find a student or a postdoc, God forbid, who has done a little bit of plagiarism or something, then you just punish forcefully whatever the level of their misconduct because they are so junior. 
I was once asked to conduct an inquiry for an institute where they kept referring to the poor postdoc as a delinquent. And I was like, this is academia. It's not, the person is not delinquent. The person may have plagiarized. We don't even know. Why are you calling him delinquent? But, you know, this is an attitude we take. You know, the director cannot be delinquent. The vice chancellor cannot be delinquent. Only a very low-ranking person is delinquent. This is another thing, conflict of interest, to defend the accused if they are from your own institute, regardless of what they might or might not have done. Okay. Another thing which comes from laziness, you have three cases of, let's say, plagiarism. They are very different. One is minor, one is major, one is critical. But you punish all of them equally because you say they are all cases of plagiarism. No, you have to go into the detail, collect the facts, and then you have the, the punishment or the action has to be in proportion to the, uh, to the, to the um, misconduct and cannot be random. But equally important as investigating misconduct is, of course, preventing it. And I've argued many times that every researcher, student, faculty, postdoctoral fellow should be exposed to a mandatory ethical training module whenever they join any institute, which starts by saying, this is what this institute expects you to be like. But it should not be a one-way lecture. It will work only if it's interactive and if maybe half of the uh, uh, proceeding of the uh, training module uh, is allowing students or faculty or participants to ask their questions and actually understand what they should not do and why. So in ICER, I have used the following example to good effect when interacting with students. Supposing your family member is going to have a critical surgery, one day before, someone tells you that the surgeon had cheated in their surgery exam in medical school. This person's skill will decide whether your relative lives or dies. How will you feel about this information? Does this affect your outlook on cheating in exams? And you see, of course, it's going in a certain direction, but we don't have to answer it for them. We ask them, and you usually get a better response if you ask somebody to think for themselves and not tell you the answer. Just tell themselves. You say, go away, think about it. Tell yourself the answer, chat with your friends about it. This is the way to plant some direction of ethical thinking. Now, institutional context is very important. Uh, and this is why the statement by the institutional authority needs to be clear and rational, not pompous of the kind proper behavior or patriotic or whatever, and backed by consistent action. So to give you an example, in early days in ICER, when we didn't really have these guidelines ready, a student who was punished for cheating told me, sir, we didn't know that ICER is serious about this kind of thing. You should have told us before. And it's funny and sad also, because you can imagine where the student came from. Maybe came from a school where cheating was freely allowed and suddenly had to readjust to a different environment. But it's not only students. Uh, an investigating committee once was shocked to find that senior researchers, fellows of an academy, uh, responded to this uh, image manipulation in their own paper, before, of which they were clearly guilty, saying everyone in our institution does it. And how is this an ethical defense? So this shows that you know people place their ethics in the uh, context of where they are working. And I also want to highlight very quickly for you, and now I think I should finish in about five minutes, um, this business about dismissal of, I mean, I'm just, I don't want to respond to any ex-minister's demand. It was never made formally, but uh, the idea of dismissing people who plagiarize is so premature because there are many, many degrees of plagiarism. And I'll show you a graphic which will highlight that. But I'll also tell you that probably everyone here, all 31 of you who are hearing this talk and whoever might view it later and myself have probably indulged in one of these acts of plagiarism, possibly due to carelessness or insufficient understanding at some point in our careers. It's very difficult not to indulge in some form of ethical misconduct. And the goal is not for us to be hyper alert every single second that, oh my God, is this plagiarism? Oh my God am I cheating? Oh my God, did I do this or that wrong? You should be alert, 
but in a practical, pragmatic way. And if you are found to have done something and your institution tells you dispassionately that, look, sorry, Professor Mukhi, what you have done doesn't meet our bar, you say sorry and you correct it immediately. And this is why this business of dismissal is or punishment is not the cure-all solution for everything. The most important thing is correction and not punishment, especially in this context. So here is an organization which has made a slide showing 10 types of plagiarism on an axis of more serious horizontal axis and more common uh, ver vertical axis. So, so, for example, they say secondary source plagiarism, where you quote not the primary source, but a secondary one. Invalid source, when you reference an incorrect source. Uh, duplication, where you duplicate your own work in another publication. Paraphrasing, where you take someone's ideas and repackage them. Again, some form of paraphrasing is okay, some form is not okay. We need to train in that. Repetitive research. You know, when you read this, you realize that everyone is doing it to some degree or other. The question is, how serious are you about not doing it? Not whether you are staying completely free. And you could call my research repetitive because it's on the same topic for last five years. I don't think it's repetitive. We can debate that. But, you know, then replication, uh, same manuscript published more than once, misleading attribution, unethical collaboration, for example, guest authorship, as I mentioned earlier, then there's verbatim plagiarism. And then, of course, there's just taking the whole paper and calling it yours. So there are many degrees. Okay. And this is somebody's opinion. This is some company has put out an opinion. But I think we should realize that the degrees are very, very important. The degrees of misconduct. I'll say a few words about image, image manipulation. This is a growing at, uh, problem in scientific areas. Now, Obviously, if I take a photo of my experiment and I rotate it 90 degrees, I haven't done anything. It can't be unethical, but I could change the contrast. I could cut something. I could paste one image in place of another image. There are lots of things we can do with images. And there's a website which mostly highlights complaints of such manipulation, giving authors a chance to respond. This is pubpeer.com. Now, as usual in India, we see extreme responses. One view I've heard is that if you're accused on pubpeer.com, then you should be punished. But it's an anonymous, remember, people can post anonymously. You can't believe on face value what people post. But the other view I've heard is that since it's anonymous, it should be ignored. So you see two absolutely polar opposite views. The truth, as always, lies in between. First one should look at such complaints on pubpeer and see if they are frivolous or ill-conceived. And if they look possibly reasonable, then collect the facts. This is the thing I've repeatedly emphasized. Collecting the facts is the most important thing. And in this case, the facts are there. You can actually download the paper, see what the images claim to be, and see why somebody has flagged them as manipulated. Now, journals also, of course, uh, look at uh, complaints, ethical complaints. They sometimes ask you to insert a correction. Sometimes they retract your paper. And uh, if that happens, then the paper remains on the website with retracted written over it. Now, retraction has been going up the last 20 years. This is the rate of retraction as a percentage of published papers only in science and engineering. I don't have data for other fields. But as many people have highlighted, Retraction can be for honest mistakes and it can be for misconduct. Again, we need to find out which one is the case. Some retractions are straightforward and honorable. And there's a case I've listed here, but I won't go into it. Uh, but the important thing is that we should never penalize a person for an honest mistake. Hmm? And we should never confuse an honest mistake with misconduct. And it's easy to confuse these things. Okay. Uh, plagiarism, of course, I think people know what it is defined as. This is the definition. Taking someone else's work or ideas, passing them off as one's own. Uh, it can involve lifting of textual material, ideas, research results, incorporation of some ideas or results of other researchers without proper attribution. So I think with this, I've more or less said everything I have to say, but I want to quickly in a minute, do I have a minute or two? I think I started at 4.05, so maybe sure, I do sir. have a minute. So please, yeah. carry on, carry yeah. on. 
<laughs> okay so you know in my article in the hindu i said something about vice chancellors and this is the 20 year old issue but i think you should know it because many of you are too young to know it and also because it showed up a lot of cracks in our society but also the heroic action of one of our uh, fine presidents of the country so uh, the story of how he was caught and also defended before he was caught is a very salutary tale so first let me show you and i'm assuming you are all non scientists a paper from stanford which is highly technical i don't expect you to understand a single word in it it's on black hole physics but this is an extract from the paper of rajput and his student and i think if you just uh, can read words then i think you will quickly understand read the last word the first word any word in between and you'll see that they have simply pasted that here and uh, this person renata kalosh someone i know well actually she's a very leading physicist at stanford and she got frustrated that nobody in india was doing anything about this the journal retracted it it was a european journal but nobody was doing anything to the guy so she organized a campaign by stanford professors to the president of india apj abdul kalam in october 2002 and he set up a committee to investigate in his capacity as president of india meanwhile the governor of uttaranchal state told the press that nothing wrong has happened and vested interests are trying to damage the reputation of uh, the vice chancellor the students union also supported the vice chancellor here's a report from amar ujala newspaper of the time which has somehow i found in my scrapbook and times of india also quoted that the university students union sided with rajput alleging a campaign by vested interests well the committee met i know somebody who was on it they told me that when the chair the, this judge sr singh saw the thing i've shown you he was like look what are who are we fooling it's so obvious and so he was asked to resign by the way he was not punished he was only asked to resign as vice chancellor let me be very clear about that right okay so that's uncommon this extreme plagiarism is uncommon but there are cases where people just copy and page uh, and paste let's say one page of material but they don't cite it properly their main results are not stolen so you see these are poor ethics but they are not really people intending to be bad it's mostly people who are poorly trained and of course it is plagiarism and it has to be remedied but it could be remedied easily by publishing an erratum and revising the paper on the plagiarism scale it was somewhere moderate neither very minor nor very major so as i said earlier many of us have carried out unintentional or inadvertent plagiarism okay so we have to learn how to paraphrase how to use how to quote how to cite okay now i'll conclude with this quote uh, which bothers me a lot and uh, which is that in institutes in india there's ethical misconduct going on or there has been ragging as you know in one in the university recently the institutional heads are complacent but if anybody dares to stick out their head and say anything that's uh, against the vice chancellor or director or head or government or anything then they face charge sheets for their opinions this 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 is disturbing because first of all it cripples academic research people learn that you can get away with misconduct just don't criticize anyone powerful so the wrong conclusion and it also a sign that our ethical and academic foundations are going astray so this is an alarm bell i would like to ring and i think once reciprocity and outcome directedness these guiding principles are internalized by us then i think things will improve but question is how long it will take for this to happen we risk going into a kind of quagmire of this emotional power centric approach and not getting to the core of it which is we want reciprocal ethics and we want outcome directed ethics so thank you very much So oh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Neil Mukhi. I would say that in a long time I have listened to a lecture on ethics which goes beyond medical ethics and which goes far beyond a simple plagiarism. I think you have very amply highlighted that there are layers and layers of 
uh, violations as far as ethical practices. And thank you very much for pointing it out to the audience that simply because you are on the right side of the law, it does not mean that you have not violated the ethics. What I liked in your presentation the most is that it's not a technical problem for which you could find a technical solution. So anti-plagiarism tool, most of the time the, yes. and the discussions are around anti-plagiarism tools and uh, finding that, okay, uh, well, uh, chat GPT written answers, can it be detected by anti-plagiarism tools? And now you find that students or anybody could uh, get something written by chat GPT or by Bing and get it paraphrased by Killbot and then polish it through Grammarly and then present it to, to you uh, which the technology. So, but the problem is not a, it's not a technological problem. It's a human problem. It's a I completely problem. agree. And it's a problem whereby people are trying to benefit at the expense of the other, which you said in another words, but very, very forcefully. That, okay, you wouldn't like others to become rich at your expense, and therefore you wouldn't want others to become rich at your expense. And therefore the society should be built around this principle. Uh, you are very right that students sometimes try to see that, okay, they just need to circumvent the legal and the technical aspects. So they write something and they come to you and you say that, okay, it seems like you have picked the ideas or you have taken it. But sir, I, it is not exactly matching. But the question is that, do you know that it is your idea? It is your articulation, it is your conclusion, or it is somebody else's conclusions. So question your conscience. Questions as to whether you have just saw that, okay, if the police does the investigation, you are found not cheating, not stealing. But then are you sure within your heart that actually you have not cheated, you have not integrated? I think students need to be uh, sensitized. So I think the guidelines, I think uh, another important part of your presentation, which I'm uh, repeating, is that it is not only that you give a guidelines, either in this format or that format, uh, the dictatorial format or a format in which you try to uh, address their uh, emotions and conducts and behavior, uh, is just only one part of it. But I think uh, training people, training institutions, as to how to go about how to ensure that these things uh, do not happen, or perhaps the institution or the leaderships of the institution have a kind of zero tolerance, if not zero tolerance, the minimum tolerance. Uh, about these kinds of practices and that should be, I mean, it is nobody's case that, okay, you always take a very harsh action, but then the fact is that somebody reaches up to the level of the vice chancellor, one very known case you gave, another that happened much later in case of the Pondicherry University. Uh, I mean, uh, you are all familiar, there's no point uh, giving name that she a professor of law, been vice chancellor of two universities before, became vice chancellor of the third university. Some politics in the university brought this fact to the highlight that what she claims to have published and what she claims to have supervised is actually inaccurate and there is no evidence. And then again, the visitor intervened and the ministry intervened and it was found that yes, she cannot substantiate and she had to go. I mean, the fact is that all through the, I mean, you reach to the vice chancellor at the uh, fag end of your academic career, almost at Indeed. the fag end of your career. So you sustain yourself in various powers of authority as head or as dean or as chairperson 
or members of various committees and you could survive and continue, I think uh, the institution need to think about it. I think uh, by the time a student come to higher education, it is already a bit too late. Uh, at the age of 27, 28, they are too mature to change themselves. So I think this kind of sensitization should also start from the school level. You see, I mean, uh, simple, simple things, if you are participating in a debate, uh, colloquium, uh, and then you find a student, uh, sixth standard student, seventh standard student, taking something or copying something, and then speaking, speaking in her own style and then getting a class, I think the teachers should, uh, in fact, inculcate in them or sometime in a subtle, not in a subtle way, rather in a rather blatant way, like in the CBSC examination, the expectation is that the student would produce answer to a question as it is given in the book. So it not only kills creativity, yeah. but it also encourages yeah. students to do plagiarism. Absolutely. They write it as their answer to the question that they were posed to them. But then uh, throughout their teaching it for as a preparation to the board examination, they were taught that unless you are uh, giving the same answer which your book gives, you will not get a good box. So there will be a cross. That's right. You will get a zero. I think that also needs to be addressed. I think students uh, believe more, youngsters believe more what they see us doing rather than what they hear us doing. So I can go on, I can go on giving them lectures, sermons every day in my lecture on the importance of being punctual and regular. And if I'm myself coming late to the class, right. I'm very sure that the student would... Uh, do what they see me doing rather than what they hear me doing. Absolutely. So and the teacher resorts to unethical behavior, unethical conduct in one form or the other. Publication is a important part, but still if you see the whole gamut of academics is a very small part. Uh, but yeah. the rest of the conduct of the teachers are far more. Uh, the, the way you teach the class like Somain was saying or uh, uh, favoritism or victimization. Uh, these are the extreme actions, but in a subtle way, uh, not preparing for your lecture and going to your lecture. And then uh, not being just to the student when they ask question or simply shutting them up yeah. when they uh, try to counter you. I think they all run counter or contrary to the behavior which is expected from teacher. So I think uh, I appreciate and I admire, uh, I missed, uh, I think, your article in Hindu. I myself occasionally write in Hindu. I missed reading it. Uh, maybe I'll find out and uh, go through it. But I think you uh, did a great justice to this whole issue of academic ethics and integrity and taking it that this is not a question of only the animal rights or human rights and uh, be careful like in the life science research or medical research. Mm. Mm. And also not only about plagiarism, it is not also about detecting uh, the plagiarism and giving clean check if the technology mm. says that the matching score is this much, rather addressing to the conscience of the students, of teachers, of institutional leadership, of the institution themselves, of the overall system of higher education to become aware and to nip in the bird, uh, nip the problem in the bird. I would conclude by saying that yes, it is very true. I mean, what happens in the society reflects in the institution of higher education. We are part of the society, but we cannot use this argument to absolve ourselves that, okay, if the society is corrupt, the teachers are also corrupt because the education is supposed to make better human being. And the better human being should try to change the society to become better. I think with this spirit, I have taken your lecture and I immensely benefited uh, from your presentation. And I thank uh, CSPS for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you everyone at CSPS.